Hello, this is a video on the Hyperoptic ZTE branded router, wireless router thing, which is model number ZXHNH298A. Default IP address of it is 192.168.1.1. This video is hopefully going to be useful for anyone who has to remotely support somebody who uses one of these routers and you can't get control of their computer or tablet and you need to tell them what the screen looks like and where to find stuff. So to start off with, the password is on the underside of the router and it is the last thing on the sticker on the right hand side and uh, it's just called user pass and it's a very short uh, six or so character password but it is random and unique per router. Let's log in and this is what the main page looks like. It shows you what devices are on the wireless LAN, what devices are on the LAN, what's plugged in via USB, and if there are any telephones or VoIP services configured. So let's start with the clicking the username. That apparently logs you out again. Uh, click on Internet at the top and it gives you status information to start with. Clicking on Ethernet connection status, uh, this is plugged into just my home LAN, but if you are plugged into Hyperoptics Network or OMT on your wall, uh, you'd see different, much different information on this page. Apparently it can support a 3G dongle as well, for backup internet, whether that's usable or configurable, um, not sure, but the hardware does support it. Under security, you end up getting settings, so it looks like you don't have the ability to change any of the internet side WAN settings at all, and um, under security you do get settings you can change. You can change the firewall settings, probably want to leave this as is, um, you get filter criteria for filtering URLs, which I can't imagine works very well. Let's give it a go. So URL filter is on. Uh, we want to have it in block mode. So let's try blocking BBC. Let's uh, try changing or adding in www.bbc, so www.bbc.co.uk, just to make sure that uh, it isn't because it's uh, Google's filled in or taking me to the www host name. Let's go again. Okay, so the answer there actually is it can do it. You just need to make sure you add all of the host names required. So if you add in facebook.com uh, and not www.facebook.com, or you add in the inverse and you just do uh, www.facebook.com then the other one will work still so you do need to add for example like I've done here bbc.co.uk and the www version of it as well so let's turn off the filtering because we don't need that that's uh, surprising that it there you go, now, now I've turned off the filtering it does load again surprising that it does work you can also filter against uh, source or destination IP address and the same for IPv6 as well. You can set DMZ which is basically uh, called demilitarized zone or essentially port forwards every single port on the router through to that device rather than individual port forwarding which you're doing here. If possible always use the individual port forwarding. Uh, doing something like DMZ to a game console really is a bad workaround for finding out what the correct settings are. By all means, if you want to play a game once and quickly, and you're going to remove the uh, the DMZ as soon as you're done, then that might be a, a, a good quick solution. But ideally, find out definitively from the uh, game creators what ports are required. Um, quite a lot of the time they'll say, oh, you need to forward port 80. And uh, no, that's, that's rubbish. Um, it will be a bunch of really obscure ports that you need to forward rather than 80 and 443 which are very common ports. So say if we wanted to set up 
our Team Fortress 2 server. I know for a fact it uses UDP. Now I want to allow every single IP address, so I'm just going to leave that alone. And it's going to be hosted on that computer on my network. The port's going to be 27500. And the internal port, I'm going to see if I can leave that blank and whether it will guess. No, okay, so that's also going to be on 27500. Apply. There we go. And also I want to create, uh, not that it's really used these days because everyone uses cloud-based email services like uh, Google Workspace or Office 365, but let's try SMTP, TCP, and my mail server is going to be 192.168.1.5, port 25 for SMTP, it's common the port that it's on. And there we go. So that's how you create port forwards. And if you wanted to remove, you can either temporarily switch one off or on, and then click on apply, or you can delete a port forward there. Not sure what the IPsec switch function is, doesn't make any difference and doesn't give you any further uh, information or settings whether you select that on or off. It's interesting that it's on default, on by default as well. Parental controls will be uh, times that devices are allowed to access the internet. So you could select a game console and then say that it would only be allowed uh, or ban internet access every day between, for example, 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. And a bit like the port forwards, if you needed to do it for multiple devices, you can just select multiple ones further down here. Moving on to the local network section, gives you a lot of status about what's currently enabled. And it looks like you can have a, a plethora of uh, wireless names if you wanted, have loads of them. LAN status gives you the status of each port, so you can tell, uh, well, it doesn't tell you what speed the port is connected at, but you can tell which of the LAN ports on the back of the router are in use. Wireless clients, which none are connected, so you can't see them there. LAN client status, which just shows you which port it's in and the IP addresses that have been obtained. And USB storage, if you had put a USB stick into the side of the router. So underneath the status on the left is the wireless settings, where you can turn on and off the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz, and where you can change the channels that the router is using for its Wi-Fi and also not that you really should to, uh, need to reduce it these days you can reduce the mode that it uses so if you had what's a really old device a Nintendo, a Nintendo Wii I think uh, could probably only cope with 802.11b or uh, or something. You shouldn't ever really need to do that these days unless you have super ancient devices. Under the WLAN SSID configuration is where you can change the encryption it uses and actually it looks like you couldn't connect something like a Nintendo Wii anymore because it doesn't let you select WEP security which is old and very broken and very simple as where you can also set your wireless password. Be aware that you have to set the password and the name for both 2.4 gigahertz here and also 5 gigahertz as well. So if I wanted to call this Bob's house and set the password as welcome123, if I saved that you would still see the 5 gig, it would change the 2.4 gigahertz and you'd still see the 5 gigahertz as the old name and also the old password. So you do need to make sure you change it as well further down in the 5 gigahertz section. I'm going to see if this is going to be infuriating and when I press apply does it wipe this and I have to type it again. Let's have a look. 
No, that looks like you can change them independently, which is nice. So there we go. If I looked at a phone now, I would see uh, instead of the two wireless networks called uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, um, if we revert it back to the name here, uh, that one's called 5 gigahertz, the other one was called 2.4. Uh, if I looked at a phone now, let's get back to that page, they should both show as Bob's house as one network. And it, uh, my phone or whatever device you connect will select the most appropriate 2.4 or 5 gigahertz automatically. We've got Wireless LAN Advanced, which is where you can do, I guess, MAC address filtering, which Definitely do not use MAC address filtering is trivial to get around. MAC address spoofing on wireless networks and viewing what other MAC addresses are connected to a network is very easy. So I wouldn't recommend using this. If you have somebody connected to your wireless network who you do not want connected to your wireless network, the best option is to change the wireless name and password and make sure you do not tell them the new password. So WLAN radar, this is going to be interesting. I presume it, yes, scans for all nearby wireless networks. So you can tell which channel is probably best for your router to be using. I'm afraid for privacy, most of this screen will be blanked out on the video. Clicking on the LAN, it shows you the DHCP allocations, so computers that have requested an IPv4 address, and you can also change under DHCP server the IP address of the router and also uh, the IPs that the router gives out. So if you had a bunch of servers that were below or within a certain range you can notch out some of those numbers. It doesn't look like you can turn off the DHCP server. See if uh, removing, no, that is required. So this router always has to be a DHCP server. You couldn't use this router as a wireless access point only uh, because it doesn't have the option to not be a DHCP server and then fight whatever the main one is on your network. DHCP binding is where you would put a MAC address and make sure that that MAC address was always given the same IP address. So if you had CCTV cameras that you couldn't set a static IP address on, you could fill in the MAC address of the camera here and then tell the router always to give it the same IP. Looks like you can also individually turn off and on LAN ports or the wireless ports in essentially so the different wireless names. I expect they'd still be broadcasting, but traffic just wouldn't flow over them. FTP server is probably to do with if you plug in a USB uh, storage device to this, so like a hard disk or a memory stick, you can FTP into the router and uh, retrieve and, and put files on it. UPnP, interesting that it's off by default, but for most hyperoptic customers it wouldn't work anyway because hyperoptic use carrier grade NAT or network address translation where multiple customers share the same IP address. Um, if you have a static IP address then you could switch UPnP on and it would allow programs like torrent clients and games and game consoles to automatically set up their port forwards. And the port map table would show you the status as to whether any program on the network or device on the network has done uh, some of that automatic port forwarding. DMS, which I presume is something media server, and again will be uh, if you've plugged a storage device in, a USB stick, and uh, you wanted it to serve video to devices on your network, so it's probably a bit like DL D DNLA, um, media sharing. Samba service will be, again, if you have a storage device plugged into this and you wanted to access it from a Windows computer, you could, as long as you turn that on, 
do backslash backslash 192.168.1.1 and uh, click on OK and it would bring up the files through Windows Explorer. Moving on to VoIP, because it's customized, you've got no ability to configure these. This would be configured remotely by uh, HyperOptic if needed. And a call log screen, which would show you any inbound and outbound calls. Going into management and diagnostic, probably just gives you a couple of bits of status information and where you can change the admin password. Time out if you walk away from the computer and how long until it logs you out of this web page. Remote reboot the router, remote factory reset the router. And you can back up and restore the configuration. So I'm interested to see, it looks like it's not going to be user viewable. And sadly it isn't. There may be a way, if you knew what you were doing, to retrieve or change individual settings in this file, but there's also a chance that it's uh, encrypted. There is one thing that's going to be interesting for techies to know, which is this router takes the TR69 information from DHCP. So on my network here, I have DHCP handing out a TR69 uh, value. This router asks for that value and then started communicating with my ACS or TR69 server. Uh, I haven't yet dug in to see whether I can actually change values on it, but it would be interesting to see if I can change the non-changeable DHCP option in here, which would then allow me to use this router as an access point. And it would also be very interesting to see whether that would also give me the ability to edit the VoIP settings uh, and use it as a VoIP analog telephone adapter. So yeah, if you're super geeky, you've got your own Genie ACS server or other uh, TR69 responding server, uh, you might be able to change more of the settings on this, so, um, this router. The difficulty will be trying to get your DHCP server to hand out the correct uh, option value for that. Hopefully this video has been helpful to you. If it has, it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my YouTube channel. You don't need to have the video notifications switched on, but the subscriber numbers really do help. Thank you very much.